<laughs> All right, guys. Well, for the few of you still sticking with me, glad to report we are pretty much exactly at the halfway point of Peruvian Plunge, going into Chapter 18 now from Puerto Maldonado, Peru. So we're going to label this chapter Everything You Ever Need to Know About Puerto Maldonado, Peru. And uh, this is a long chapter. I apologize if the camera turns off and we got to pick up in the middle. We're going to start off with a quote from the Handbook for the New Paradigm. As you begin to understand a larger picture of this point in the history of your planet and the segment of humanity that now resides on it, you can pinpoint your own experience within the scenario. If indeed you are a volunteer who has placed himself in a lower dimensional experience in order to assist the individuals trapped there, then it hardly seems fair that you must be bound by the confines of that dimension. Unfortunately, that is how it works. However, it was understood when you volunteered to do this, there would be a point when you would be fully reminded of who and what you are and of the agreement you made. In other words, you were promised a wake-up call. This is your wake-up call. We are now at Tuesday, June 16th at 2009 in the hellhole of Puerto Maldonado, Peru. <clears throat> My earplugs had done a valiant job of blocking out all the most egregious horn blast and motorbike noises during the night, but even they were powerless against the shrill chatter of two young children heatedly engaged in some sort of indecipherable, vaguely Spanish dialect screaming match at the crack of dawn just outside my glassless second story window. Silencio! I screamed back at them into the milky first light of morning, more to the kids' parents than to the little brats themselves. If anything, my impotent protests only seemed to exacerbate the cacophony. I rolled out of bed and flung open the curtains, hoping that the jolting sight of an enraged naked gringo would shut the little fuckers up and send them scampering off back to wherever it was they came from. On the other side of the curtain, perched on the balcony overlooking the, the hotel courtyard, sat two squat green parrots. Hola! screamed the one on the left, eyeing me hopefully for a breakfast handout. By this time, I was, of course, hopelessly awake. I headed into the bathroom where, for the first time since leaving Cusco a month before, I got to study my reflection in a real mirror with a real light above it. Looking back at me was some bleary-eyed, red-faced old fart that I vaguely recognized from somewhere in my distant past, but I couldn't positively ID the face of the, the face as that of Santa Claus, too fat and jolly, Rip Van Winkle, much too well rested, or cousin It, the closest. No razor or scissors scissored had molested my mug since before Christmas. My old man's beard rolled and tumbled out of my face like so many gray loopy tendrils of Spanish moss cascading from my cheeks and chin almost to my collarbone. I had been harboring some weird fantasy of letting my beard grow wild, untamed and unchallenged, until December 21st, 2012. But looking in the mirror at the deranged desperado peering back at me, I judiciously decided it might be more prudent to do a wee bit of weed whacking on my whiskers. I would need all the help I could get in the quite likely event that Puerto Maldonado's ATM machinery had some sort of disagreement with my debit card. Copping to this genetically encoded gringo fear, 
transaction not available phobia, I reluctantly retrieved a tiny pair of scissors from my bag of cannonballs and carved cousin it into a rough equivalent of Wild Bill Hickok. Ooh, muy guapo, very handsome, cooed the coquettish young flirt behind the reception desk with just a hint of ambiguous sarcasm as I walked through the lobby and out the door. As I had more than an hour to kill before the bank opened, in Latin America, ATMs are wisely locked up inside the lobby at night. I threaded my way through the onslaught of motorbikes and tuk-tuks, Chinese-made three-wheel taxis that look like a cross between a golf cart and a motorcycle to track down a cup of coffee. <clears throat> As I nursed a passable cup of joe, I was entertained by one of the most common tragicomic rituals in Latin America, one that transpires millions of times per day from the Rio Grande River to Tierra del Fuego, the dreaded no I combio, there is no change ritual. The rules of this cruel game are quite simple. No matter what Latin American country you are in, and no matter how cosmopolitan the city, though the game gets more dangerous the farther you move into the boonies, if there is more than a dollar's worth of difference between the item or service you are attempting to purchase and the denomination of the bill you're attempting to purchase it with, you, the buyer, will be met with the distraught stare and the melodramatic anguished cry of the merchant, No, I combio! I don't have any change! The ultimate goal of this ploy, particularly by taxi drivers, who you can be sure have enough change in a bag under their seat to gag Linda Lovelace, is to pocket a 50% tip. At the very least, it's an attempt by the seller to guilt trip the buyer into believing this is the buyer's problem. Of course, this is nonsense, particularly if he has just eaten the vendor's product or taken a ride in his taxi, but even so, his transgression often results in the buyer being held virtual prisoner for several minutes as the seller, who after dealing with his shit for years, should have known to have a pile of change in the fucking cash register, runs up and down the street trying to unload the bill onto some other sucker. This is exactly what was happening at 7 a.m. to the poor schmuck in front of me, a polite, well-dressed businessman who had the unabashed gall to pay for his five sole $1.66 breakfast with a 50 sol a $16.66 note, the only bigger unspeakable crime punished by hanging would be to pull out the dreaded 100 sol a note. Even armed robbers will return those to you as they are, for all intents and purposes, illegal and worthless tender in Peru. Th this flagrant outrage on the part of the patron sparked a drama inside the tiny restaurant where a casual passerby would have thought the place was on fire. The stalwart businessman, his breakfast tucked safely and irretrievably inside his digestive system, stood firm in his quiet resolve to wait for his change, while the once sweet proprietress morphed into the wicked witch of the West with a bucket of water upturned over her head. It cost him about ten minutes, but the guy did get his change and business resumed as usual, at least until the whole ritual repeated itself again, and again, and again. 
the reckoning hour of 9 a.m. finally arrived and I strolled across the town central plaza for the much more serious and terrifying ritual of squaring off against a Latin American ATM, a dangerous high stakes game with even odds of winning or losing that could strike terror into the heart of Jimmy the Greek. If the universe slapped me with the transaction not available curse or banish the very thought if the machine gulp ate my card, I would be facing a lifetime of white slavery, hosing myself down with mercury under the blazing sun of a mother of God gold mine trying to get the bus fare home. I mean, the stakes were high. I ambled up to the glass-fronted battlefield just as two stone-faced, armed-to-the-teeth cops were removing the heavy padlock and chain from the door. Believe me, this is the one and only time in Peru you will be happy to be sandwiched between two armed cops. I motioned to one of them to follow me inside the cubicle to be my witness just in case the machine tried to pull some stunt on me. Mouthing a silent prayer to the ATM gods, I pushed in my little blue plastic lifeline to the world's biggest planet-eating bank and watched helplessly as it disappeared into the void, feeling like Vincent Van Gogh's mother bidding farewell to her young son from some French village train station platform. With the guard shuffling nervously beside me, why was he nervous? I punched all the little buttons the machine told me to. After a five-second ice age of tense silence, my ears were blessed by the sweet, whirring music of 500 soles, $165 sliding out of the machine, and five crisp 100 sole denomination notes. There was no time to worry about that small fire, however, because I still had one last question to answer for the demanding machine. Would you like another transaction? I answered, no. The machine just sat there stupidly, drumming its fingernails and tapping its foot impatiently. Would you like another transaction? It taunted me as I heard other irritated customers lining up outside the door. I searched for the, for the, you stupid fucking machine, I already told you. No, now give me back my fucking card button. And pressed it, and pressed it, and pressed it as panic flooded over me like locust over a lettuce patch. We apologize said the machine, you have taken too long to make a selection, so we have retained your card. Please see bank management. No! I almost sobbed, feeling my knees go weak and my throat go dry. By this time, a mob of angry customers was rapping at the door, and the cop beside me was nervously fidgeting from foot to foot, nudging me to hurry up and move along. I pantomimed to him desperately that the thieving machine had eaten my card, and I had nothing to look, look forward to except a lifetime of white slavery in a Peruvian gold mine. He stared uncomprehendingly at the unfathomable histrionics of Eco Touristicus Americana in a panic in front of him, casually reached behind me and pressed the cancelar button and handed me back my debit card, giving me that all too common, these poor helpless gringos, how did they ever become the strongest nation on earth? kind of looks. An hour later, 
<clears throat> I had suffered through the interminable line in the lobby to beg the nice teller to bust up the five 100 sole notes into 25 more manageable 20s. I emerged victorious from my raid. I was restored, invincible again. I was a gringo with cash in my pocket, loaded for Jaguar and itching to tackle whatever the Amazon jungle had to throw in my path. But first, I had to get permission to take my first step on my newest path into the deepest heart of the real Peruvian Amazon the largely unexplored Yellowstone-sized primeval wilderness of the Amaracari Communal Reserve, which my fellow Texan Dallas-based Hunt Oil Company was hoping to turn into an oil and gas field unless a real estate agent from Austin could kick their ass out and thwart their $40 million planet-eating fantasy. In order to get that permission, I had to go through not one, not two, not three, but four levels of Peruvian bureaucratic red tape. Leaving the bank that fine June morning, I set off confidently to do just that. My confidence buoyed by the fact that three of the four offices I needed to visit were right there in Puerto Maldonado. For various and sundry reasons, chief among them being that I don't want to end up rotting in a Peruvian prison or floating face down in the Mother of God River should these mad ramblings ever actually get published and end up in the hands of the various bureaucrats I interviewed off the record about the sleazy shenanigans of Hunt Oil Company and the Peruvian government, I won't bore you with such details as people's names and the bureaucracies they work for. Instead, I'll just give you the usual jauntist, ham-bone, doom and gloomy overview of the truth of the situation and you can decide for yourself how accurate or objective the story is. I was thrilled to find that bureaucrat number one who I will call B1, spoke perfect fluent English. So I might actually be able to understand more than one out of every four of his words. Since the question on everyone's lips, particularly since the Bagua mass massacre, was obviously, what do the natives who live inside the Americari Communal Reserve think about Hunt Oil's plans to turn their ancestral home into an oil field? That was the question I led off with. Since then, I have asked this same question to a dozen other people who know a lot more about the issue than I do and have gotten a dozen different answers. Since I don't feel like writing and you don't feel like reading or listening to these volumes of minute differences in opinions, I'm going to take the risky Peruvian plunge of summarizing all these diverse opinions into one ham bone overview, knowing full well as I do that this version of the truth will not jibe perfectly with any one version I have heard, so everyone I interviewed will feel like their ideas were misinterpreted. Such are the risks you take in the Peruvian Amazon, I guess. At any rate, here goes. <clears throat> The biggest problem of all engaging native resistance to Hunt Oil's plans in Amaracari is that nobody knows for sure what the hell it is they want to do there. Nobody even knows for sure whether they're looking for oil, for gas, or both. Hunt is the major player in the ecological boondoggle known as the Camasea Natural Gas Pipeline about a hundred miles north of Amaracari. Hunt's own laughable, predictable, fox-guarding-the-henhouse environmental impact report 
claims honestly, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, that for now they simply want to poke around in the woods to see if there's anything of interest to them. Of course, this innocent sounding poke around in the woods will involve, according to their own estimates, blazing some 300 miles of seismic testing trails through the trackless wilderness, detonating more than 12,000 explosive charges and carving more than 100 helicopter landing pads out of the virgin rainforest. You don't have to be Nostradamus to predict that after spending that kind of dough that of course they're going to want to punch a couple of test wells into the ground to see if anything interesting bubbles up. The second biggest problem engaging native resistance to Hunt Oil's plans, as I've alluded to before, is that Amazon Indians, like everyone else on the planet, have free will. Ask the 2,000 or so natives in Amarakari what they think, and you will no doubt get 2,000 different answers. Again, at the risk of oversimplification, here is how I would characterize it. The wild heart of Amarakari, ground zero where Hunt wants to go hunting, is ringed by eight native communities comprised of three not very communal tribes. These eight villages, each represented by a headman from a loose-knit association. Last time the association was polled, a few months before Bagua, when native versus big oil became the biggest story in the country, the headmen, the headmen were unanimously opposed to any and all exploratory activity within their villages. The classic NIMBY, not in my backyard, response. So far, so good. Of course, if you look at Hunt's own maps, you will notice that their exploration zone doesn't even touch five of those eight communities. Even the remaining three villages, which have already suffered extensive environmental damage, much of it inflicted by the natives themselves, are on the outer periphery of Hunt's obvious real bullseye, the rich biodiversity hotspot of the communal part of the communal reserve. Hunt could compromise with the natives by pulling out of the actual three villages and it would barely affect their bottom line. Obviously, it will be easier for Hunt to buy off the natives' acquiescence, whether through job offers, financial infusions into local schools and clinics, or outright offers of cold, hard cash, than it would be to stir up the potential hornet's nest of the communities themselves. That is, in fact, Hambo Nostradamus' crystal ball prediction of exactly how the game will play out too. Sadly, I am left with the doomy gloomy conclusion that if Hunt has the brains to show any restraint and class when dealing with the locals, they're going to win and the tree huggers such as yours truly won't be able to count on the local natives to back them up, especially in the backwoods of the reserve despite centuries of evidence that the planet eater's intentions in the Amazon are anything but benign. The lure of the almighty American dollar and the plastic baubles it can buy folks who feel like they've been shortchanged in the plastic bauble <coughs> department for way too long will simply be too great of a temptation for them to resist. It'll be a few temporary jobs instead of beads, but it's just the latest version of the man moving in, 
pushing the Indians out of the way, wreaking havoc in the forest and in the culture, then abandoning them to deal with the mess when they've gotten what they came for. Will we ever learn? Back in Puerto Maldonado, bureaucrat number one assured me that his bureaucracy, at least, was 100% adamantly opposed to any development, exploratory or otherwise, in Amaracari. When I mentioned I had heard repeated rumors that their office was not taking enough of a hardline stance against Hunt, B1 bristled and explained, sotto voce, that the president of the Native Rights Organization was looking down the barrel of two trumped up charges of terrorism against him already. If he pissed off one more person in the big oil friendly Peruvian government, he could be looking at 20 years of hard time in a Peruvian prison. You tell me, how hard would you squawk? From there, I hopped into a Chinese issue tuk-tuk and zoomed across town to bureaucracy number two. This was going to be a short visit as nobody in the office spoke one word of English. The friendly chief bureaucrat there assured me that his organization also was adamantly opposed to any exploration into Amaracari by Hunt. After stating that position, he proceeded to gift me with the approved 2006 copyright Amaracari Master Plan, which expires, appropriately enough, in 2012. To this day, I am not clear on exactly who the author was of this schizophrenic report. I turn to the short, and I mean short, discussion of potential hydrocarbon development in the reserve and read, warning, I'm choosing to quote this document at length because it provides a priceless peek into Peruvian government gobbledygook that is hilarious on a darkly comic level. If you want to skip over it, you will not lose the narrative of the story, but you may miss a couple of sick laughs. But of course, I'm getting ready to read from the Amaracari uh, Community Report from 2006. Quote, <clears throat> During the elaboration process of the master plan for the Amaracari Communal Reserve, it was determined that hydro carbon activity is currently not a threat to the natural protected area as it is currently not practice. <laughs> then I added planet eaters and tree huggers alike cannot argue with that logic. Back to the report. Nevertheless, if this activity was carried out in the area without respecting the current legal basis, this would would signify a threat to the objectives of creation of the communal reserve and its buffer zone. The experience in the system of natural areas protected by the state, Sananpe, and the experiences of native and farming communities located in those areas related to hydrocarbon activities are not very encouraging. We have, we have, for example, a first case with Block 8 located in Pacaya Samaria National Reserve, where a series of unfriendly of unfriendly environmental impacts occurred due to bad practices, like, for example, the sinking of a ship where no less than 6,000 barrels of crude oil were spilled into the waters of the Maranon River, broadly affecting the health of the Ashwara ethnic group in the area and hundreds of acres of floodplain forest where highly sensitive and biologically rich habitats were affected. 
A second case occurred in the buffer zone of the Titicaca National Reserve where in the district of Pusi in the province of Wanake, there is a great environmental impact due to chemical contamination with formation waters, crude petrol, minerals, and other toxic substances coming from inappropriately sealed oil ex exploration wells. That spill spilled directly into Lake Titicaca near the Ramis sector of the natural protected area, affecting areas fit for agriculture in the surrounding areas, followed by the loss of the vegetal cover, natural pastures, canes, and deterioration of the aquatic habitat, hydrobiological resources, wild flora and fauna, causing great social and economic harm to local farming communities. Diagram that sentence, class. Due to these previous negative experiences, the present environmental passives, those inside natural protected areas, as well as those outside them, and due to the very nature of hydrocarbon activity, this one seems to be a potential threat to the objectives of the creation of this natural protected area, its buffer zone, and the local people, as any misfortune that might occur could have great impact on ecosystems, landscapes, objectives of creation, and the conservation prioritize of the Amarakari Communal Reserve, which is the reason why the company, meaning Hunt Oil Company, should assume the responsibility of any impact on the communal reserve and repair any damage caused as a sign of respect of the existing and applicable legal base. In the same way, the company Hunt oil in this case, should be respectful towards the customs of the communities that benefit from the Amarakari Communal Reserve within the existing and applicable legal framework. On the other hand, and this is where the report gets really weird and starts smelling strongly of greased palm, on the other hand, hydrocarbon activity could be identified as an opportunity for an appropriate management of the Amarakari Communal Reserve. This is proven in cases like the one of Peru liquid natural gas, where Hunt Oil holds 50% of participation and its work in Block 56, which contributed to the gathering, systemizing, and publishing of primary biological information in the Mashaguenga Communal Reserve. My comment, of course, the cursed Camasea pipeline this is referring to also contributed to serious and widespread destruction of the area, though this little detail is convincingly ignored by the report's enigmatic author. Back to the report. In the same way, Plus Petrol has been supporting the management of the has been supporting the management of the natural protected area in the case of Paracas Natural Re National Reserve through a financial fund that allows the improvement of the management. Actions like these contribute to the establishment of the best practices of environmental management of the industry. And they show that currently hydrocarbon industry and directly used NPA, uh, and I'm not sure what NPA can be developed 
given that the established laws and rules be respected, given that the management is carried out under the current international standards and that in the exploration and exploitation phase, the latest technologies and personnel highly specialized on hydrocarbon activity be employed and above all that there be the environmental commitment on the company's side in order to avoid or minimize the environmental in impacts inside of oh, the natural protected area and its buffer zone. My comment sounds like a hell of a lot of quicksand firm givens to me. Back to the report. In this case, it is necessary to understand that the needs of the Amarakari Communal Reserve can be supported by the hydrocarbon industry with different mechanisms and instruments to strengthen the management of the natural protected area and its local natives. Based on what is pointed out in the previous paragraphs, and on the existence of an exploration and exploitation contract between the government and the company Hunt Oil, Block 76 of Peru LLC, the National Institute for Natural Resources will be respectful of the contract mentioned above between the government and the company inside the protected area. In the same way, it is recommended that during the exploration and exploitation phases, the company Hunt Oil maintains a permanent information campaign about the technologies to be used and activities to be carried out for the native communities that benefit from the Americari Communal Reserve, that it encourages the participation of the benefiting native communities <clears throat> and the uh, the the uh, Peruvian government uh, in the environmental monitoring of the company's activities during each phase inside the communal reserve and its buffers, buffer zone and that it elaborates in a coordinated way with the benefiting communities and the supposed Peruvian government's environmental arm the environmental impact study for the hydrocarbon exploration and exploitation. Whew! That was one hell of a mouthful of bureaucratic BS doublespeak. The other gift <clears throat> B bureaucrat too blessed me with was a pile of maps of the reserve. On one of them, sitting right there in the middle of Hunt Oil's hopeful oil field, like a fat rabbit in a field of hungry coyotes, was a little mark that looked strangely like Monticello, the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. Looking up the symbol on the key, I read the words, Restos Archaeolicos Identificado por la Cia Boca Ishrihu. In other words, there appeared to be some largely unknown and unexplored Inca ruins in the middle of the very jungle where Hunt wanted to blow off 12,000 explosives. Hmm. I thought to myself with my little ham bone tree hugging brain clicking away. I wonder if there could be anything to this. I was thrilled to see that bureaucracy number three was in the office just upstairs from B2. I walked upstairs and smacked into a locked door, a pattern that would repeat itself time and time again over the next several weeks. 
Just my luck, the bureaucrat I needed to talk to was in Cusco. That settled it. The next day, I would take the highway to hell back up the hill. I had come down less than a month before. Why was I not surprised? And I'm worried about this camera, so we're going to break chapter 18 into two parts. So I'm going to come back with part two of chapter 18 in just a minute.